Hey, what's up, Liron here. In today's video, we'll learn how to paint a magical forest scene. Uh, I think this is a good process to demonstrate a variety of techniques, starting from wet and wet, and then moving on to some more larger washes that you wanna keep even. There is a good balance of color matching here too, which is something I often struggle with. So here you do get to see me match the colors pretty successfully. And then there's another layer of that, of little tips and tricks for adding opaque paint to make that center section really pop and make it feel shiny. So I hope you're gonna enjoy this one. Let's get to the process. So the drawing stage here is gonna be pretty bare bones actually. Uh, I want the colors to speak more and take precedence over it. Um, a lot of it is psychological. Sometimes I feel like if I just put a few very big shapes, um, I have more freedom when it comes to colors. Now, it's been a while since I really just went a little loose on the colors themselves, so that's another thing that you'll see in just a moment that is very fun. But uh, I'm starting left to right. I place this very thin kind of light line indicating where, it's not the horizon line, but there's kind of a trail behind that all the trees kind of conform to, so I drew that. And once I have that in, I can start putting in the actual trees with their very interesting shapes and, and you know, this tree trunk that has the roots and their one of them is leading towards us, which is just a very cool shape uh, to portray. Another one is kind of moving, not not away from us, not towards us really, a bit towards us. And then the one behind it, just massive roots that, that look beautiful and are... It's very important to convey the shadows they cast on the ground. Okay, so this is the, the second tree and the, this big root. And then another kind of smaller. And notice how I changed the gaps a bit. I made this one closer to break off that pattern. Not to have all the trees in the same distance from one another. Uh, and then the, everything at the back and between the trees is just thinner trees. Uh, that, that I'm kind of placing in, but honestly, I'll just place them with paint. Um, I don't want to put too much detail. That's exactly where I don't want to put too much detail. Uh, and then I'm drawing this kind of a line of edge of the for forest or foliage um, dividing the sky. So you see some sky above and then the trees start below that. Um, it is going to be important because the sky is almost white, well, probably paper white. And then underneath it, we have some uh, variety of greens. Um, and I'm going to indicate where that cast shadow is that is being cast by that big, big root that's going to be a big part of this painting. Uh, and I'm erasing some lines that shouldn't show through the tree trunks. Now, I want to show you, I made this little control panel. Uh, I took a colorful version and a black and white version, and then I also sampled the colors off of them and turned that black and white too, just so that I have some kind of a guide for the colors I'm going to use and, and the values. I did not refer to this throughout the entire process. Um, I actually only used it in later stages. Um, and early, very early and very late, but all the middle stages and the big shapes of value, I didn't really use it uh, as much. Now, I did use the black and white sometimes for reference of values a little more frequently. Sometimes it's good to just do this sampling work to kind of understand what you're painting, and even if you're not going to refer to it while painting, it can still be useful. Okay, so we're starting with the first wash. This is a very interesting combination of different colors. So I'm using a bit of peril in red, uh, a little bit of French ultramarine, uh, a little bit of uh, May green, which is this very beautiful bright green. You see me putting it right now, uh, and a bit of um, Indian yellow. Uh, I am trying to aim for a bit more uh, expressive colors. The sky, I just use water, as you saw, uh, just wet water. Uh, kind of wetting this area and then I get these beautiful gradual transitions. Now I'm gonna aim, because initially I planned for this process to almost be abstract, I'm gonna aim for achieving quite a lot wet and wet. Uh, not everything, not the final dark values, but a lot of the lighter values I will try and get like right now while this is still wet. Um, and that's something that you want to pay attention to, especially the thickness of paint that this requires. So I'm mixing a bit of my red, a bit of my uh, yellow. Uh, sorry that the palette's a little dark. I'm actually going to fix that later on in editing. Hopefully it's not too dark on your end. Um, and, and look at how thick this paint has to be, again, to negate the wetness on paper. Uh, and this is not nearly enough. This is just for kind of a first passing. I'll, I'll have to go over it again at least twice more. Uh, also look at the water bunching up on the lower section. Uh, these kinds of puddles you just want to get rid of because sometimes you're running the risk of them the rest drying and then you'll get this cauliflower uh, of them be, being wet next to a dry area. 
Uh, so I'm pre-wetting all of the wells. Uh, one color I did use a lot here is this uh, umber. Uh, it's kind of a burnt umber. It's the only one in this palette that actually produces a dark value easily. So you'll, you'll see me especially later on using that umber together with French ultramarine. But for now, it's just Perlin red, Indian yellow, French ultramarine. That's the main one and some sap green to supplement. So you see another passing to kind of indicate. Now, these trees that are really close to us aren't as important to indicate this way because I'm going to have a specific wash for them. Um, the trees that are more at the back, achieving these kind of wet and wets will allow me to have them very blurry and blended and weak um, against the sun because we are painting here against the sun. So this becomes very important for the trees that are farther away from us. Now there is an interesting thing going on here where you look at the sky and it almost looks like blindingly light. Uh, this is actually will be our paper white, but the, the thing that helps this illusion is the tops of the trees. Notice how they go from brown to kind of a pink uh, brown and then uh, into just disappearing. You can't see the tops of some of the trees on the right top right corner. That's what leads to the effect of blinding sunlight. It's nothing more than that and it's a quite a crazy illusion. It takes some time to understand how to create it and I'm definitely not m a master of it. I'm still learning how to create it but uh, I think in this particular example and in my sunny forest uh, scene also I did a pretty good job at that. Um, so I'm starting to push the colors a bit because I want to have some interest. So I'm seeing a bit of that orange there. I'm exaggerating it a bit, putting a bit of red. Um, the funny thing is in this initial wash you you kind of need to worry about color matching, but not as much. I find that if the first wash is very light, you can use colors that are close enough and then define the proper actual colors in the next wash. Now, after the next wash, with the big shadows that are a little darker, that's when it becomes harder to change the color. But in this starting stages, believe it or not, you can be kind of close and it will still work out. Now, one more thing to have in mind. The ground is our foreground. We see a lot of it and there's leaves and there's dead leaves and there's all sorts of uh, weeds and plants and, and petals uh, and branches and all of these details. It really is impossible for the most part, you get a glimpse of my face, it really is impossible for the most part to get all of these details in unless you're going hyper realistic and you're really working frame by frame. And that's fine. Some people are into that. I'm just not as much into that. So you, you'll see me establishing a lot of these in this, these first stages where everything is still wet. You'll see me starting to establish some shadows. Later on, I'll put some shapes and then blend them with the water sprayer or with a brush. Um, so just something to have in mind. Uh, the ground is it's complex. There's a lot going on there. So I would focus more on the larger shapes of value. Um, for, for the ground and then start bringing out some details. You'll see I'll do a lot of work in opaque paint too here. Um, so just kind of a side note. Also put that layer of foliage behind, very important because that's what gonna, if you want to have a sense of light, you have to close off the darks uh, and have them surround the light. So once we got rid of that foliage part of the sky, it makes the actual sky lighter and it already feels like it's a little bright. Uh, nowhere near as close though, once we darken things it will make more sense. Now I'm using my brush, uh, a, a wet brush that I squeezed over uh, a paper towel to lift back a few small highlights. Now this is, and I'm also splashing some water, believe it or not, this is actually quite light once it dries. It's going to be good for our highlights, but I did want to bring out some of those strong highlights on the roots. You see, so just using, now I'm using my lifting brush just a bit, just to give myself an indication that's where the root is and to be aware of it in the next washes. Not a must, it would still work without it. You can pretty much, and I've shown this before, you can pretty much fix a bad first wash very easily simply by darkening the right things. Um, if you make mistakes in the color, if you make mistakes in value, as long as it's light enough, it's not that big of a deal actually. So now everything is dry. This is why the colors look much less vibrant. Don't worry, the bright vibrance is gonna come back. Saturation is gonna come back. And I'm starting to paint the trees. They're basically a kind of brown. A brown with hints of green for the moss. 
Uh, that's pretty much it. So I'm using that burnt umber kind of color together with my French ultramarine. And this allows me to have a bit of a temperature, uh, a range of temperature. So I'm not just with that warm or same boring color. You do get a lot of blue in it, a little bit of warmth from the umber in it, a little bit of yellow in it too. Um, but the most important thing is now we're working on the shapes. And how do we bring out the light? By painting the dark. And that's where you really want to focus on these shapes. And I think I did a, an okay job. I actually did other aspects of this painting a little better, but it still will read well. You will see, it will read well. So I'm following that shape of the root. That's a major part here, a major feature of the painting because it's a point of very high contrast, lots of interesting shapes, not just this root, but all the other roots as well. Uh, the one coming towards us, the one that I'm painting right now, and the ones in between them. Very important features, and once put in the right context, it's going to be beautiful. Uh, using a bit of a damp brush to blend that top edge, make it a little feel a little rounder, the transition is actually a bit gradual. And here I'm starting to feed into that shadow being cast by the root. Now you'll notice I used a bit of red there. That's a part of me wanting to use some expressive colors, at least. Uh, to, to bring out a flare of warmth there on the ground. I just felt like I, it was there and I wanted to convey it. Uh, and then I'm indicating that other root that's a little shorter, as you can see, it goes into the ground earlier. Um, I made it a little too long, but that's fine, uh, by painting the shadow around it and by rendering this shadow. And look at what I'm doing here. I'm connecting this shadow to the ground, to a larger pattern, to a larger texture that is a um, ca that characterizes the ground. Remember I told you, you can't really convey, you can't really show every small detail on the ground, you'll go crazy, right? It's possible, but at least not for me, and I know the kind of people that watch my videos is kind of similar in that way. Uh, so I'm, I'm blending it into existing shapes, and then you'll see me softening some edges and so on, but I'm also not planning on painting each and every leaf on the ground. Um, bringing in some green there to make that transition from the uh, uh, shadow to the light. There, it feels to me like there's a bit of a green there over the transition. And more than that, it's going to be maybe a bit of a blended edge in some places. Uh, you see there's a bit of a, a transition in the shape of the shadow there and, and two kind of smaller roots that come out of this main one. So and, and if you're losing your track here, if you're disoriented, it's all about really looking at shapes and you can do something like the grid method. If you're having a hard time with it, I have a video on it. So uh, you can search YouTube for that, the grid method. If you want to have an easier time orienting around a painting, making sure you, you're putting things in the right place, that's another way of kind of uh, doing that kind of a thing. Um, so just have that in mind. Uh, it is important that the ground is a little darker than the root that's coming towards us. So I'm darkening it. You see, and that allows me to soften some edges for the uh, cast shadows and to blend these assortment of random shapes that I put in. Now at this stage, nothing makes sense and that's fine. If you look at the shapes, you're like, oh, okay, it's kind of similar, but it still doesn't make full sense. Um, and that is simply because uh, we, we don't have the context. We don't have the background that's darker and, and makes the lights feel like lights. Uh, we don't have anything. Uh, you know, we call it the ugly stage, you can call it whatever you want. To me, it's still beautiful, you know, with time I start to really enjoy this stage where things are built up. Here I am putting a bit of blues in there, that will look really great. You'll see it in the final scan too, they really show. Um, but to me, that's another part of the of the process and it's a beautiful part of it. I actually really like this. So I'm adding a bit of neutral tint because I want to put a stronger shadow where that root meets the ground. In that exact point, uh, there is a bit of a darker shadow going on there and I wanted to really indicate that. So here goes. Um, and that will hint at a connection, right? Now, the moment I put a tree behind this one, then that highlight on the root is really going to pop off. Uh, so just just be aware of that. Um, there is a bit of a reflected light from the window because it's such thick paint. So you'll forgive me for that. And hopefully once things dry, it will look a little clearer. Now we have that stray branch. So I'm kind of, I like to put uh, a few random details within the shadows, whether they're uh, blended or wet and wet or wet on dry um, to, to hint at 
the the things that are there. Again, I'm not painting each and every detail, so I kind of have to hint at them in a way. And that's a skill, and that's a skill I feel like I'm more of a master of when it comes to cityscapes and rendering, you know, rooftops and stuff like that. Um, it's something you just learn with experience. And I will say that probably painting similar subjects helps. So if you paint a lot of these forest scenes, you'll start learning what patterns look good. And then you'll know how to use them and you may decide to use a pattern you don't even see in the reference photo. Maybe you recognize this interesting pattern of light and shadow that zigzag or you know little stripes that you don't even see here but you like it so you borrow it from your memory and use it on that scene, okay? Now look at that piece of green there. You can see it, it's this triangular shape. And I'm gonna put that tree and it's gonna touch it. And it's gonna blend together. And I like that idea of it blending together with it. And the most important thing here is to stop high enough uh, for the shadow to be created, uh, for the highlight of the root to be created. You see, I leave a light gap for that. Oh, you'll also notice I added a few more branches to the top. Just, I they're not there in the reference photo, but to me, I like these branches that are coming out of the sides and they're probably there somewhere, maybe higher, uh, but I wanted to indicate them, so why not? So I put them in, uh, a bit of dark, wet and wet, with more blue than umber this time. Um, just to bring out some coolness on the shadow on the shadowy side, yes, and uh, and you see how this brings out the the shape of the root that's more in front of us, right? Now there's a lot going on here in terms of highlights. There are plenty of shapes of light, um, a lot of these twigs and the leaves and all of that. We're gonna put some of it later on, wet and wet. Don't worry, uh, not wet and wet. Um, opaque on dry and sometimes on wet too, you'll see. Uh, but look at how it starts to take shape, right? You can start recognizing, okay, so these are roots and these are branches and, and it feels like massive trees, you know? Um, and that just feels good to see it slowly come together. Now there's a lot of orange there. I'm using my Cadmium Red Light by Paul Rubin. Uh, very orangey red, it's not really a Cadmium Red, it's more like an orange. Um, putting in some of those trees at the back while this green underneath is still uh, a little bit wet so that they'll uh, merge together a bit. Um, now these trees do have to be a little straighter than what I did here because they're a little farther, they're thinner, uh, maybe but probably farther rather than thinner. Um, and you want them to feel like trees. So you see, even though I kind of messed it up, they still feel like trees, so that's fine. Uh, I also think the angle of the paper skews it a bit. Now, if you take a few steps back, already this starts to feel like a forest scene. So things start to work well. Um, I would say it would be interesting to paint another version of this, uh, only this time to perhaps paint uh, larger and maybe have a drawing that's a little more detailed. Uh, just to see how I, how much of those details on the ground and on the branches I can capture. But a lot of it is a, a game of patience, right? So um, it's not necessarily even skill. And uh, by the way, just a quick note, these trees at the back, I'm using a wetter wash. It may look darker. It's actually uh, slightly lighter than what I used so far um, because they're farther. And you'll see there's this, this sunlight looking directly at it and this hazy look, it makes everything in the background a little lighter. So we'll darken the foreground a bit and we'll keep the background light and you'll see, especially the tops of the trees that really melt into the sunlight. That And that's what's responsible for this strong effect of sunlight, as I mentioned before. Uh, and to further enhance it, I'm also darkening a bit of that again, uh, area of foliage behind to separate it from the sky. Um, as for what I was saying earlier, it could be interesting again to paint this with a bit more of a tight, tightly drawn uh, pencil lines so that I know more of what I'm painting and really being a little more careful with the leaves and shrubs and, and all of that. It could be fun um, as kind of a personal challenge maybe. It's again not, not the scenes that I'm most uh, used to painting and rendering random details in. I'm very... Um, accustomed to the cityscapes and the more human-made um, light and shadow elements uh, that are quite different from a forest. Um, 
but yeah, I love that that you see how the top of the tree just fades into the sunlight. That's that's a really fun effect to get. Um, honestly, a really fun uh, process. I tend to enjoy processes that have large shapes, large shapes that you can play around with within them and and enjoy the best qualities of water or color within them. You know, things blending together, things kind of, it's just a fun way of approaching things. Um, and I find that if you take a few steps back, squint your eyes a bit while you paint, you can actually paint something that is fairly realistic um, just by following those shapes that you see. Uh, you don't really have to work from a logical place, I find. For me personally, I can work from a more... Um, feeling kind of place, kind of detach my brain and look at the shape painted the way I see it, uh, which is a fun way of doing things. Uh, now I'm darkening that tree, I told you the front one, using a bit more blue on that lower section just to create an interest in temperature. And again, you see kind of light coming from the window. My apologies about that. It's it's going to fade later on. You'll see it in, better in the scan. Uh, but slightly darkening this, I'm going to go over some of the other trees, but very lightly. At this stage, uh, you have to be a little careful, um, especially for the farther ones. You don't want to use this kind of a dry, brushy effect. Uh, maybe just for the next one, because the other ones, if you do that, it'll make them pop right towards us. And you want them to keep them at the back here. You really want to make sure they're just back there, lighter, fewer details, you know, not as much going on there. Um, so yeah, really just be a little careful with that. Um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much, I mean, there's more for the process, but just the, as long as you get the shapes in the right places, the values are somewhat accurate, you should be good. And feel free, one more thing, feel free to split this process. You don't have to merge shapes. You see me working on every tree individually. You can even, um, uh, I guess, divide trees into different areas. You can, um, you can paint in small patches and disregard whether something dries and you get a hard edge. There are plenty of ways of making this process easier, though I don't think it's that hard if your drawing is simplified, right? Um, and sometimes, you know, I will recommend painting larger if you feel like you're having a hard time getting enough details in there. Um, but sometimes there is value to making these small paintings. Like this is fairly small, as you can see. Uh, there's quite a bit of value in getting these uh, small. Because and and you know you'll you'll laugh if I show you how big the reference photo on my screen was that I used, uh, very small. I just wanted to see the main shapes. Only later did I zoom in a bit. Okay, now I felt like the contrast between the ground and that kind of stray tree root root that's moving towards us wasn't strong enough. I wanted to make it pop more. So and you'll you'll see in the reference photo, it's also a little darker, the ground. So I added a few of these random details. And I like, while I have these random details, to do some stuff wet and wet. Uh, some of these shadows on the sub branch, sub roots, so to speak. Um, and then some shapes on the ground. Why not make use of it whenever there's a wet shape on the paper? It's an opportunity. And I like to, to make use of it. Um, this area isn't even wet and I'm still darkening it, you see. It just feels more like the trees anchored to the ground, uh, if you know what I mean. Um, one more thing to have in mind is, uh, you know, oh, it looks bright, right? That's that's a fallacy. People look at the painting, they're like, it's so bright. Uh, and they think it's because the colors are very perfect. They're very pure. It's just a pure green, the lightest, purest green which makes it shine, or the orange is very bright. That's not the case. The, there are a few things to have in mind here. One is the values. The values, that's the light and shadow. That's what makes things light. And then second, the temperature to some extent, but to a very limited extent. It's not about using a pure yellow or a pure green. None of that. Okay, we'll revisit this point later on maybe. Now I'm using opaque paint. I'm using a mix of my John Brilliant and my pale green, both Shinhan PWC. PWC, they're, they're called, yeah, PW, PWC, right? I forgot, I forgot the name of the brand, Shinhan PWC, yeah. Um, and I'm just putting in some of those branches. There are so many of them. Uh, sorry, that was the zipper uh, of my sweatshirt running against the mic. Hopefully that wasn't too loud. Um, 
look at all of these branches, just stray branches. You want to put them uh, in because what happens right now is we have the main shapes. We still don't really have a good enough of a focal point, uh, which is those roots, in my opinion. So to really bring it to focus, I'm starting to put these enhancements there, all of these leaves and lighter sections. And again, it is not about using pure color. What I'm using right now is not green, like you would see in the reference photo. It's a mix of green and white, and it's more towards the white, if I'm being honest with you. The thing that makes a color shine is not it being pure. It is its context in terms of temperatures, in terms of maybe color, but color as a temperature. Temperature as a subset of colors, uh, or as a subcategory of colors, and the values. That's that. That's the secret. Um, you can make something shine even without a strong contrast of values, just by using the temperatures. But, but it really is not about using a clean color out of the well. Because a lot of people are worried about my dirty palette and they tell me your palette's so dirty. How do you make things shine? How, do you, how are you even able to ever get something to look shiny? That's because it has nothing to do with the purity of paint. And that's something I want you to have in mind, okay? Now I'm using this same mix to enhance some edges on the roots where I want them to feel maybe like the, the light shines a little brighter. So you see me doing that. One thing I will say I'm missing a bit uh, in some of the green areas is a bit more yellow, actually. The green is so light, it's actually yellow in many places. Uh, but it's not a big deal. Again, it's not what's responsible for the shininess or whatever. Um, and look at how all of these kind of in the middle really enhance that section, uh, make it look cool. Now I'm adding a bit of orange to that. My orange, the Academy in Red uh, light, is already quite opaque, so it worked really well with this uh, white mix, uh, white and green mix, and I'm using that to bring out those orange leaves from before. Because if you re-examine the color I sampled from them, it's not a pure orange, it's actually a muted peach. Um, so that's the kind of the color I'm using. Here I didn't match it perfectly, but that's fine. Uh, I see a lot of it kind of going around the back there, so I'm, I'm indicating it. Now one really cool thing to do is once you have these highlights, add a strong contrast to them by putting painting next to them something dark. You will see me do that after I finish rendering all those small branches. See I'm mixing dark paint, and then I'll complement them by justifying their existence by drawing the shadowy side of them. Now you'll see this in just a second. First I put a few of these branches, you see? dark next to light. It's an effect I wouldn't overdo, like try not to put darkness next to every single highlight you, you drew, because that doesn't make sense. That's not really how things are in real life. But in some select areas near the center where you want to bring more attention of the viewer, that's a good place to do that. Um, it, it just adds a, another layer of interest in my opinion. Uh, of it. It could be interesting for me to tackle this and make a larger version of it. I think I actually will do that. Uh, I'm actually really motivated to do it now because I want to get all of those smaller um, branches and leaves a bit more in a more uh, convincing way because I really like the way they look. So you'll probably see a larger version of this sometime soon. But we're almost done here, really almost done. Just a few more twigs, a few more branches, a few more leaves. Um, and uh, in just a second I'll show you the final result and you'll see how it, it does shine a lot. Uh, right now there's a bit of reflected light that makes the darks look a little lighter. Um, but overall a very nice scene, magical scene. Scenes that are against the light, they just work. They just work for watercolor. I find that they're easier to tackle very often. And I like scenes where the local color is shifted by the mood and atmosphere. I find them both easier to paint and more interesting. If you paint something that is just perfectly lit, very saturated, it can be too much and, and, and it feels very artificial. You know, I love when there's fog, mist, rain, all of these things contribute. That's what I believe at least. So here it is without the tape, 
Uh, and here is the final sketch as well. I really hope you enjoyed this process uh, and got something new out of it. So again, showing a wide range of techniques, just a lot of fun. Uh, and we can wrap it up now. So thank you so, so much for watching once again. I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, it's been a rough patch for me with watercolor lately, just because I didn't have enough time to practice, felt a little rusty. And also I'm becoming more and more aware of my inadequacies, which is, it's funny, it's, it's great to develop that awareness. It just can be frustrating, but it's much better than not being aware of it. So uh, I feel like this was a good kind of success. I also had a few good successes in the last couple of days. So quite pleased about it. Don't forget if you want to learn how to let go and Enjoy the process, paint more freely and get the results you want. Uh, be sure to check out the Frustration Free Watercolor. Same goes for the drawing course. I will link those down below. I also want to remind you there's a sale on the gallery. So if you want to get an original painting, uh, I also do these plays on Instagram stories where I post one for very cheap compared to the uh, pricing. But for now, you can definitely use code NOV21, November 21. Uh, that's the promo right now, NOV21. Uh, you get 20% off any painting, as many paintings as you want. So thank you so, so much for watching and thank you for checking my work out. We'll talk to you again in another vid soon.